Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to Martin and the guys for inviting me to talk. Um, so essentially, I think I approached, I approached Martin uh, with Matilda nearly a year ago. Uh, we had set up a deep learning meetup inside, inside the comp side department here at Cardiff Uni. And we were looking to grow the profile of it and just to you know, meet up with like-minded like -minded researchers. So uh, uh, PIDIF was fully booked out until now. So it's, a, it's, very, it's a very hard for me to get into. Um, I'm a part-time PhD researcher here at the university. And in my, in my day job, I actually work uh, in the problem, uh, the example problem that I'm going to talk to you about. So uh, looking at e-commerce data sets in particular, um, e-commerce data sets have some particular properties I'll go into when we, when we get to that section of the talk. Um, and trying to solve uh, two primary recurring problems, right? So how do you figure out what some, someone's intent is uh, in an e-commerce setting? Um, and how do you figure out what content they want to look at? So the needle in the haystack. Um, those two problems are not just e-commerce specific. Uh, they're they actually, you'll, you'll, you'll see how the, the task of recommender systems falls across many domains. Uh, but I guess, to try and make this as practical um, and as Python oriented as possible, I've got actually a work example that we're going to run all the way through. So uh, just so I can get a feel for the audience, how many people here are working on machine learning or deep learning at the moment? Small number of hands. OK, so I said that's probably about one third of the audience. OK, so if I, if I skip over things or if I annoy you by saying things you don't agree with, please, please, please bear with me. Uh, to the other side of the audience, if I, if I go too quickly, uh, it's because I've got a short amount of time and there's such a lot to cover. So I've tried to, try to stick with the really important things and, uh, and, and hopefully you'll agree uh, you know, I've done that. Okay, so uh, before I can explain deep learning, um, I'll need to explain what machine learning is because they're closely related. Uh, then I've got some examples to show you of current state of the art. Not in my domain, but I think it's interesting to see what, what other researchers are achieving in, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, then we'll segue into Python. So why is it that Python is probably the dominant programming language as far as, as, far as deep learning goes? And more than likely ML as well, to be honest. Uh, and then I'll get into the work problem overview. So um, I'll, I've got screenshots to show you, and then we'll actually go and run the code. Um, I use PyCharm inside IntelliJ as, as my IDE, so we'll, we can set breakpoints and we have a look at the data as we go through it. Uh, so that code is really going to be predicated on a number of points, right? So the first thing is we have to get our data loaded into memory and manipulate it so we can present it to the network or to, the, to, to our machine learning model, our deep learning model in this case. Then we need to train the model or fit the model to the data in, in the best possible way and um, without overfitting, which is a, a constant threat and a constant problem in, in machine learning. And then we'll talk about evaluation. So how do we know how well or not we're doing uh, with that model? Uh, Q&A at the end, but you know, it's a pretty informal group, so um, you know, by all means, stop and ask questions on the way through if you want to do that. If I can see you, because that, that light is right in my eyes. <laughs> OK, so what, what is machine learning? Um, there's there's very, some very technical definitions. There's some very non-technical definitions. Uh, I like the one which is a very broad church. Um, and I also find it to be the simplest, which is any algorithm which is able to improve its own performance over time. So there is, a, there is a learning element to the algorithm where it's able to look at, um, it's able to load some data, perform a task on that data, and evaluate its own performance with respect to what it should have done. Uh, so just a couple of details here. This is a dotted line between task and the ML model because it's not at all clear that ML models, any ML model is able to understand the task that you ask it to do, right? So does it build up an internal model of a task the way that we would as humans um, uh, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, and you'll see that because a lot of researchers do interesting things where they break, they take machine learning models which look to be very good, hold a state of the art result on a particular task, and then they'll go and break it. They'll show how easy it is to break those things. Uh, but that aside, th that's why that started, if you wondered. Uh, we need to load the data um, from our domain into the ML model. Uh, so if we're using classic machine learning, we, we tend to do a lot of feature engineering. So you might nearly invest. 60, 70, 80 percent of your time trying to come up with some really elegant, powerful feature representation here, um, and then just use an ML model off the shelf. Once the ML model does its thing and trains, we get an output, and then we have got some a specific error metric that we can measure our performance on. So we'll be able to say, you know, were you were you almost there? Were you way off the mark? And we feed, and the ML model is able to take that input and up, update itself. Okay, so um, 
for me, deep learning is actually a subset of machine learning um, because I think there's a, there's a much wider world. Uh, this is some of the things on the left-hand side there. There's, there's many, many more. If, I, if I've missed out any, any particular favorites, apologies. Uh, there's a school of thought which says that actually this green bubble is going to grow and eat, expand into this yellow bubble completely, and that deep learning is going to just one by one knock down the skittles and achieve state-of-the-art scores on almost every domain and problem you can think of. Uh, that may or may not happen. I, I, I think it's, that's a very aggressive interpretation, but none, nonetheless, so like a guy like Andre Carpety would, would claim that's going to be the case, and, and, and they would claim things like uh, computer vision, self-driving cars, you know, there's, there's nothing else except deep learning in that space. Uh, okay, but none, for the purpose of this talk, we'll say deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Okay, so at a top level then, and these are some of the criteria that I, I like to understand both by, and say, uh, are they driven by statistics or by something else? Well, they're, they're both driven by statistics. So they're both trying to find out some distribution, some, some meaningful aspects of the distribution of your data to help you solve a problem. Uh, is it possible for a human being to understand or interpret what they're doing? Uh, classic machine learning methods, yes. So and that's better. That's, that's a very desirable property. Uh, deep learning, much less so. So there's a lot of work in this area. But um, in general, deep learning is often regarded as a black box approach to solving the problem. Uh, you can use many different ways to train uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, on deep learning, uh, behind the scenes, you're almost always following gradient descent. So we're trying to do an end-to-end -end differentiation function where we've got the uh, particular error metric that we're trying to push all the way back through, through the function, through the model, uh, to be able to update the weights. Uh, most machine learning algorithms still train on the CPU. Uh, we had initially talk in the, in the corridors before we came in. Uh, and deep learning, as you'll see in a second, uh, there's a good reason for that, is almost always on the GPU. Um, you might perform inference on the CPU in the data center, but you almost always train on the GPU. Um, and you'll achieve very significant speed ups when you do that. Uh, classic machine learning will nearly always require um, a lot of investment into feature engineering. Um, and that investment can end up being domain and or problem specific. So you, you'll achieve a state of the art result, that's great, but then you'll look to try and port that and find it doesn't port because it's, uh, if it's too specific to your, either your data set or domain. Uh, whereas uh, true end-to-end -end differentiation uh, deep learning models have little to no feature, um, feature engineering, I'll say for representation. Um, and that's what I'll show here today. Uh, the last one's a bit of a, a, bit of a religious topic. So uh, whether you care or not that, your, that machine learning or the model you're using is biologically plausible. So most machine learning models are totally not, right? So there, there is no relationship whatsoever uh, between um, not only the human brain but any type of biological brain and those and those methods, and deep learning again, you know, if you want to start a fight at a machine learning a deep learning conference, this is this is one of the big questions to ask. Uh, but most people would say, okay, maybe your brain's not doing backprop, but certainly you do have things like heavy in learning and updating of weights, which would uh, lead us to believe that there is at least some overlap in how we think about deep learning and how and how intelligence works uh, in nature. Okay, so that's a nice segue into my next, my next slide. So uh, in order to explain what a deep learning model is, let's start super simple. And let's say, okay, so the inspiration came from um, uh, a biological neuron. So a neuron has an axon, a synapse, and dendrites. And if you're going to codify that into something that we, that we could draw, uh, you end up with something like this. So very simple nodes, which have uh, a weight and a bias. And they're trying to learn how to achieve some some tasks. So, th so this one is uh, solving the XOR problem. So if I have if I have two zeros, um, I want to output close to a zero. If I have a one, or if I have a one in either input, I want to output close to a one. And if I have two ones, I want to output close to a zero. Um, so this is probably one of the one of the simplest uh, networks that you can train and draw, which is quite on this slide. Okay, so. Uh, these networks can be connected. So these networks can be described as a graph. They're a graph of simple nodes. They can be partially or fully connected, depending on what you're doing, and there are different reasons why you do both. Uh, they have an activation function. So, so this node here is aggregating two weights, and then it needs to decide if it's going to fire or not. So you have a, a an activation function which controls whether this this node or neuron is going to stay quiet and say no, I'm not going to have any part of this particular input, or whether it's going to actually fire uh, and try and drive some output to the next to the next layer in the network. 
and that is and that is it, right? So before we go into you know um, all of the really or really advanced stuff in current state of the art, that's what a neural network is. Okay, so deep learning extends from this. Um, they get much deeper, as, uh, as the name goes. I've got some, some diagrams for you in a couple of seconds about uh, you know, some of the competition winners. Um, they use multiple layers. And, and the, idea between th the idea about multiple layers is that uh, each layer successively is able to abstract a particular part of the problem. So that, problem might be, uh, that abstraction might be solving a non-linearity that can't be solved in one layer. Um, it could be doing things like our visual cortex does, where you've got simple layer, simple features being abstracted and then, and then aggregated into more complex features. But in some way, the, the layers are important. The, la the layers are really key to driving the performance of these deep, deep learning models. Uh, there's, outside of why Python is used heavily in this space, um, it's really the explosion of good data sets and good hardware, specifically GPUs, to run them on, which really made deep learning come alive. So 2009 plus, um, there's all kinds of uh, anecdotes about various students going to Google Summer of Code and you know, over a summer they were able to beat, beat out um, Android Voice and, and Siri Voice and all the rest of it. But really there was an explosion of good data sets and good hardware. Uh, on the theoretical side, um, to some extent it's, it's, it's deeply, unsatis pardon, pardon the pun, deeply unsatisfying, right? Because uh, deep learning has great empirical results, and then when you look to do the analysis and say, why am I getting this result? It's not as good as machine learning. So you can't point to, this feature gives me that score. This ability to create a, a decision tree or a kernel method is what's giving me that score. Um, and when you look at the, like, you know, the experiment section of a deep learning paper or the method section, you know, you'll see uh, pictures of um, embeddings and activation functions, uh, you know, like, you know, that they're called Hinton, Hinton diagrams, you know, red to green, whether they're firing or not. But they don't, they don't explain, and they still don't, still don't explain today, why deep learning actually works, uh, which some people find deeply unsatisfying. But empirically, it holds state-of-the-art performance, uh, specifically in computer vision, sequence-to-sequence -sequence translation. That's why Google Translate has gotten so good, over, especially over the last two or three years. Um, dialogue, text-to-speech, we'll see that in a second, uh, and handwriting recognition, and, and more too. Okay, so, so let's have a look and <coughs> see what deep learning can do. My mouse will work up. This is Tacotron 2. Um, the link's going to be at the end. What I want to show you here is this part of it. If that's highlight. Yeah, so Tacotron 2 or human. So this is, this is you know, the latest model from uh, Google Research. Um, I've got a little speaker here. And the task you're going to try and figure out is, uh, we've got one and two, we've got a few samples, and which one is the, which one is the network and which one is the human? So. Here's a, and I don't know the answer either, by the way. So we'll, we'll just see. This is so this is state of the art in uh, text to speech. That girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. Okay, that's number one. That girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. So I find that impossible to differentiate. So we'll try the next one. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. And the second. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. So that's. Uh, at the top, they claim they get a mean opinion score of 4.53 versus 4.58, so virtually indistinguishable. Uh, so Tacotron 2 is, you know, pretty... Do we, do we know which one is which? Do no. We, know? we don't know. No, I, I still don't know. I, I, I tried looking random, so it just says, uh, just says which is which. So <laughs> one of my supervisor claims he knows. He reckons he's... Uh, he reckons well, that that's actually both sounded far more human than the first two. Really? She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. The first one sounds like a robot, and the second one sounds like a human. To me too. Yeah. Really? Okay. Um, now I want to show you. So this is self-supervised. So this is learning from a video. Let's see if it goes to play. <laughs> Given a single third-person human demonstration, 
a reward function is constructed. That function rewards following the progression of the video at the semantic level. The robot arm initially tries random motions, then learns to reuse the controls yielding the highest rewards, and finally, converges to reproducing the demonstrated task. The model converges after only nine iterations, which is about 15 minutes of real-world training time. So that's to show you that, and then both of those are from Google Research. Uh, and the last one I'll show you, this is probably nearly the most impressive thing. Let's see if I can... Maybe I can do. Rendering photorealistic images using a standard graphics pipeline is complex. What if we could render images with a generative network instead, starting with high-level labels that are much easier to create and edit? We present a generative adversarial framework for synthesizing 2K photorealistic images. To show the advantage of this approach, we provide an interactive interface for users to quickly edit objects in the scene. Let's try out our tools. We can select different colors for the car, or choose diverse textures for the road. We but this is, this, is, this is all fake, so these pictures are not real. Existing labels with different ones. For example, replacing the trees with buildings or cars with roads. Moreover, we can add new objects to the scene, like inserting a new car at a particular location with the desired object size. Finally, we can just paint on the label map to create novel scenes, like adding more trees into the image. Note that these shapes, colors, and textures are completely learned from the models without having any human intervention or handcrafted filters. Maybe the street view is a little boring. Let's do some portrait editing. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, probably by the end of this year, uh, it truly will be fake news on Twitter because uh, <laughs> you, won't be able to, you won't be able to watch anything on Twitter or on social media and wonder if it's uh, generated by deep learning, uh, by, by a DL model. Or whether, or whether it's real, and that's true for audio and video. Um, so I guess, and this was in the abstract for the talk, um, if you look at the kind of building blocks that are in place now for deep learning, um, I would argue we're almost at the case as the internet was in 1988, right? So that was, that, you know, for where, and you ask yourself, uh, if the internet was able to progress from 1988, 1988 until now, in terms of, in terms of what we've been able to, to achieve there, then what does deep learning hold for the future? And that's why I, that's why I think it's enormously exciting. Okay. Okay. So why are they deep? Um, they're deep because they need to be able to, to be able to do this feature abstraction. Uh, this was state of the art in 2014. It was 22 layers. Uh, ImageNet is like well, actually just been retired because it got too, uh, DL got too good at solving it on the on the CNN front. But um, it was the gold standard for uh, image recognition. Uh, and labeling, and uh, this was a, this was the winner in 2014. So Google and that, uh, the 2016 winner, and I'm showing you the 34 layer network, but they actually scaled it up to a thousand layers. Um, was uh, was probably the most uh, most technically complex, one of the most technically complex uh, winners. Okay, so uh, this is this is agnostic of Python, but it's uh, worth understanding uh, why why G you know why would we care about GPUs? And I suppose the structure the structure of the of this diagram, uh, you can imagine that each one of those individual small units being overlaid with a with a, with a deep learning model. Uh, GPUs are very very good at multiplying large matrices together or multiplying large matrices and vectors. So. Uh, also, NVIDIA, the company behind um, most GPU, I know you've got AMD Vega as well, but really NVIDIA has been, the, has been the, the deep learning champion for a long time. They provide excellent library support. So you've got CUDA 7, 8, and 9, um, and then they've actually built CUDNN, which is a, a dedicated deep learning library on top of that. So uh, using Anaconda, you can install CUDA, CUDNN, and hey presto, you're up and running on your, on your GPU. Uh, I think the speed up you'll the speed up you'll experience varies. Uh, for me, I get a 15x speed up. Uh, so for I guess a, a reasonably good i7 versus versus uh, the GPU that I'm using, which is actually a couple of years old, uh, and that's that's a game changer when you're training, right? So if everything's 15 times faster, then you can experiment far more quickly and you can make changes and, and test things out. Okay, so I'm about to segue into the code. So um, I thought this was an interesting. Actually, I found it really interesting researching this slide. So. Why, why is Python so dominant in this space? And I suppose there's a, I think you could summarize it down to right time, right place. So um, 
a guy called Travis Oliphant um, and a few other people consolidated NumPy in 2005. Um, and in, 2000, in 2009 and thereafter, deep learning took off. But up until that, you know, you can use, you can use MATLAB, Octave, uh, Mathematica. There's no reason why you need to use Python. Um, but deep learning has a core requirement. So it needs a strong numeric library um, with a core object, which is an n-dimensional array. Because that's what deep learning is. You're basically multiplying over and over again these n-dimensional arrays together, and um, either either do using a chain rule forwards or backwards, depending on what you're what, whether you're training or backpropping. Um, and ideally, you want those operations to be vectorized, because if they're vectorized, then you're going to get nice speeds up, speed ups. Uh, NumPy fits the bill for all of those things. Um, NumPy is able to delegate out to C code. Uh, you can have NumPy NumPy annotations. They're currently moving towards a JIT um, as well, but you know, NumPy is just an extremely uh, good numeric library and it happens to be written in Python. Uh, Python itself, and obviously it's a fully featured programming language, right? So you've got, you've got try-catch blocks, you've got logging frameworks, you've got all the things that you'd want as a developer, but it's got a lovely, elegant um, slicing and indexing um, syntax that's not present, for example, in Java or, or, in, or, or, or in, in, in lots of other languages. So you can simply say, okay, if, if I've got a three-dimensional tensor here, then keep um, keep all of the first dimension, all of the second dimension, and keep every fourth keep every fourth item in the tensor, and that's it. Like it's it's as it's as brief and as as terse as that. Um, and I think so. From you know, once once Tiano came out, which is has now been sunset, but we really wrote, really wrote the first one. Uh, Python just achieved a position of dominance and kept growing. So. TensorFlow came out, um, Keras is a layer on top of TensorFlow, that, so that's, that's from Google and a guy called Francois Chalet. Uh, PyTorch was originally written as Torch in Lua, <laughs> didn't get much adoption, right? So um, you know, it's, hard to find, it's hard to find Lua people who want to, or ML researchers who want to go and learn Lua, just because even no matter how good you claim that framework is, they moved to PyTorch, they moved to Python, and they've had an explosion in adoption. So I would, I would, I would argue in a research setting, PyTorch is clearly far more popular than uh, TensorFlow. In production, TensorFlow is probably more popular. Uh, they, they, they focused on different things like tens TensorFlow serving and things like that. Um, and outside of that, you've got the benefit of all of the all of the pa all of the ecosystem. So you've got Pandas, which I'll show in a second. Scikit Learn, so you can compare DL approaches against standard approaches like linear logistic regression, decision trees, and so on, and many, many more. It's a really rich environment, as, as I'm sure everyone in the room knows. Okay. Okay, so globally, e-commerce is worth a, a very large amount, right? So you know, I can probably put up three or four different figures here, uh, but it's growing. It's growing quickly. Uh, that, that growth is driven uh, not just in China and, and, and India, but the, you know, in, in Western Western Europe and the States as well. Um, and as I said at the start, there's if we can achieve two things in an e-commerce um, task setting, we're, we're doing very well. So the first is, can we can we predict what the user wants to do? So are they a clicker or are they a buyer? Um, and that data set's very imbalanced. So if you're, uh, it's also quite difficult because clickers become buyers and then buyers turn back to clickers again. So you go onto Amazon, you're having a look, you're not really that bothered about it, and then you, all of a sudden you see a, that pair of headphones that's got a great sales price, and you buy it, right? So you, you move from a clicker to a buyer, and now you're a clicker again. So let's say unlike cybersecurity, where you're always malicious, right? So you know, you're, you're, you're always a buyer who's just trying to get access to the disk drive to do something or to open up network sockets. Um, and content ranking is important, right? So more and more product catalogs are huge, um, you know. So especially if you have aggregators like Amazon and uh, and, and, and if you look at the um, social regard social media as e-commerce. So what tweet do I show you now? Um, who do I recommend you follow? And of all the people that you you're talking to on Facebook, what piece of content should I show you next? Because if I get that right, then I make you sticky to that portal, and then you start doing other things, and I, I can start I can start looking for more advertising dollars from my advertisers. Okay, so, so traditional, traditionally, a recommender systems would do something like this. So you'd say, I have all my users on the left-hand side, so user one, but imagine, imagine that's all the users on a, on a very large site like Amazon, and I have all the, all the items from a product catalog as, as columns. And I have a very sparse matrix where I have some uh, reviews left by, so user one has recommended item number one and item number four, uh, user three has um, recommend uh, has left a review for item one and item two, and I want to fill in all the rest of this data. So the traditional way of doing this would be a, a matrix factorization task, 
um, and I'll call that collaborative filtering. So that's not what we're going to do today, um, but it's uh, just to explain maybe what uh, the more traditional way of doing it is. Uh, recommender use is exploded online. So I would, uh, it, it's hard to think of a system that you'll interact with on the web now which doesn't use uh, recommender systems. And they'll, they'll do it a number of ways. So even just to offer you up a fully populated home page, you know, before you even execute a search, or it, try, and, try and find that, uh, the term that's used is serendipity. So can I show you what you're looking for before you even know it yourself, right? So, uh, and that's obviously very borderline with creepy, but <laughs> never, never, never mind. But it's, a, it's almost ubiquitous now in, in, the, in the online setting. Um, it's not just e-commerce though, I do want to make that point, right? So it's, uh, it, 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 maybe you might, you might regard that as frivolous or maybe not as, as, as worthy as other things, but um, social media make heavy use of, of, of recommender systems. Um, music, so playlists, so things like Spotify, for example, is, and that's, that's going to be the next uh, challenge at, at Rexis this year, which is the, the primary recommender system conference. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to match up physicians and courses of treatment and patients, recommender systems are used for that. They're used in insurance and finance for um, lenders and borrowers. Um, and also, uh, there's a nice use case in education where you might want to find um, what courses should you take as a precursor to another course to try and reduce, reduce dropout um, for, for students, which is a, a major problem for the student and actually for the university. Okay, so the data set that we're going to work on is reasonably large in size, um, 34 million events. Um, they are uh, almost all click events with a small number of buy events, and we get to group them by a session ID. Um, the size of our product catalog is 52,000 items, also reasonably in size, small number of categories, our data set's heavily imbalanced, right? So we've got just under 95% of clickers um, and just over 5% of buyers, and that's, and that's very typical. That's a very typical for an e-commerce data set. Uh, the data set is completely anonymous, and all we know about each individual user is what they've clicked on. Um, and that's also a very growing trend. So back in the day, people would say things like, oh, I'm going to try and get you to log in with Facebook and Twitter, and then I'm going to get a look at your, your friends graph and all, the and all the rest of it. And People don't want to do that, first of all. Secondly, companies don't really want to aggregate all that data because it's quite hard and expensive. Um, and thirdly, it turns out that the most important thing when you're making recommendations is actually what the user is doing right now. So you can, you can achieve almost um, your best results or close to, close to best results without having all this big backstory that people thought was needed three, four, five years ago. Okay, so. So j just to ask you, sir. If, if I'm there and I'm, I'm a clicker once, twice, three, seven times, and then I'm a buyer, your data set would only know that I clicked and then bought on the seventh time. You wouldn't know that I was the same person that clicked, clicked, clicked? Uh, if, we, if, you had this, if it has the same session ID, I would. Oh, the same session ID, right. uh, if, 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 you came, if you came and did that on different sessions, then you'd look like totally different people. Mm -hmm. I mean, an individual, I missed the session, I understand. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, so we want to first. First, we want to classify, and it's a binary task, so it's not multi-label. We just got just got two labels. Um, you're either a clicker or a buyer, and then we'll do the recommending piece, which says, okay, of all the things you looked at, which do I think you're going to want to buy? Um, so the reason the reason I thought it'd be interesting to present this is because this was data set that I'm working on was a competition data set. Lots of people worked on it, over 850 people, um, and they they tried all kinds of different machine learning approaches, um, not necessarily deep learning, but they uh, you know used lots of well-known and understood ML, ML approaches. Okay, so probably, an, probably to answer, answer your question. So, no, sorry. so we get a session ID which lets us group the events, we get a timestamp, we get a unique item ID, and we get a category ID, which is often missing. There's lots of missing data in this, in this data set. And if the, if the person buys, so session ID 7 bought something, sometimes we get the price, and sometimes we get the quantity, but not always. So that's also sometimes missing, so um, not available to us. So we need, we often need something that's going to handle that for us. So, you know, we're interested in these people, the people who end up with a, with a, a green buy event. Uh, yeah, that's just, all, you know, this, this was a heavily <coughs> invested and, and researched competition data set. Lots of people worked in it. So um, you end up with a score. That, that score is summation over the entire data set that says, hey, if you manage to find a buyer, then great. And you get a small score here. And then you move on to calculate your, were you able to predict what they actually purchased? And if, you're, if you build me a nasty classifier which just says, oh, they're all clickers or they're all buyers, then I'll give you a small penalty. But because there's such a large number of clickers, 
that small penalty very soon adds up, and so um, it doesn't make sense to do that. So you really want to build something which has high precision and specificity in recall. So you want to just find, you want a, you want a good, true positive rate, and you want a, a low, false positive rate. Um, yeah, okay, so, so therefore, so how are we going to measure success? So we'll need to use a metric which is, which is tuned for um, being able to focus in on, on the class label that we want. So we're going to want to use uh, AUC, which is area of the rock curve. So um, the rock curve is the receiver operating characteristic, and it's simply a plot of the true positive rate, or TPR, um, against the false positive rate, or FPR, so one minus, one, one minus sensitivity. And if we had a perfect classifier, our AUC score would be 1. Uh, state of the art before deep learning was 0 0.86. So that, that was the best AUC uh, achieved on the competition data set by the guy who finished first. So actually from Yandex in, in Russia. So that's our target. I've got 25 minutes. I'm 25 minutes in. How long do I have? We can go all night. We won't have to go all night. I, I've timed myself to an hour. OK, so what part of deep learning are we going to use? So convolutional neural networks are, um, are for vision, not really relevant for us. Feed-forward neural networks aren't going to be powerful enough, and I've already, I've already proved, proved that, because they don't have any memory. So the sequence of events is important. You've got to be able to, you've got to, be able to iterate over the sequence of events and see what's, and you need memory to say, they looked at this item, and then they moved on, and they, they came back to it. Uh, I don't need, there's poor old Lisa at all, getting beaten by AlphaGo. I don't need reinforcement learning, because I don't have a delayed reward. So I have, I have a nice labeled data set, so I'm in a supervised setting. So I don't, I don't need to go down here. This will be very interesting to go to, by the way, and that's probably something I'm looking at next. So I, choose, I chose to use recurrent neural networks. Um, they're ideally suited for consuming sequences and, and, uh, and, and processing those, those sequences. OK, uh, I have no intention of explaining this diagram. <laughs> all, 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 all I want to point out is if you compare, if you compare this diagram to the simple diagram that I showed you about four or five slides ago, this is one of those nodes on steroids. So it now has, it now has memory. It has forget gates and, mem and memory gates, so it's able to choose what, what's important to remember and what it can throw away. There's, it can be described in four different, four different equations. Um, you've, got, you've got various activation functions here, so sigmoid and um, I'll use tan h. Uh, so, but essentially, so this is, this is a very juiced up node. Um, and this is, it's, it is this ability to maintain memory over time which makes um, LSTM a very good candidate to use in this problem data set. So LSTM stands for long short term memory. So 1997, Schmidt Huber, uh, um, Hochreiter, and Schmidt Huber. So it gives us that writable memory component. There's, there's other problems inside the current neural network. So you can either have a vanishing gradient or an exploding gradient. Um, uh, the memory helps to alleviate that problem as well. So they behave much, much more nicely. Um, and, and in general, if you look at sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence translation tasks and image, image captioning tasks, uh, LSTM and a simpler version called GRU, gated recurrent units, would hold state-of-the-art in, in those tasks. Um, and there's a fantastic uh, exposition of what LSTM is, uh, uh, and it goes through lots of those diagrams, turning things off and turning things on at the, at the, URL, at the URL at the bottom here. Okay, so what do we want to build? So we, we want to build a network in PyTorch which, where we can basically model our sessions as sequences. Um, we'll do a bit of unrolling through time because user dwell time is important. So the more, the more you spend looking at something as a user, intuitively that says, hey, you're interested in that. So you know, you, you're, you're not going to spend 10 minutes looking at something on the web unless you have at least a passing interest in that, in that item. Uh, I'll pass it through an embedding layer. Uh, we'll cover that off in a second. Uh, three layers of, of LSTM, uh, 256 cells wide, uh, with tan H activation. Using a bit of dropout on the way through, dropout helps me to regularize, so I prevent overfitting. Dropout, it, it sounds crazy, but basically what it says is, throw away, you know, with a 10% probability, literally drop out these values. So you force, you, you, you force the network to work harder um, to be able to learn uh, what's really important instead of overfitting on just the data that you're showing it. Um, and when I get to the top of the network here, uh, combine all of my, all of, sorry, that should say uh, 256, not 512, because uh, I, I just divided it by two uh, to get better results, which I, which I, which I did. 
But so now I'll have a simple linear layer where I'm going to combine all of the values together into one and feed it into through a sigma function to get my binary classifier at the top. So uh, zero means the model thinks it's a clicker. Um, anything over uh, anything over 0.5 means it thinks it's a uh, thing that's a bar. Okay, so that's what I want to build. All right, so coding, and we're about to switch into the coding now. So I want to use pandas to get the raw data off disk into memory, and um, a bit of pandas and NumPy to clean and transform the data. But so what I really tried to do in this in this task is put z give give deep learning zero features. So um, I I built another model which which uses a more classic. I use gradient boosting machines, which are decision trees. And I spent about four months building features to get the performance um, where, where it needed to be. And the goal for this research was to say, could, could deep learning uh, figure all this out by itself? That's, that's, that's the promise and the aim of deep learning, and I wanted to see if it could do that. Uh, we're going to want to split the data. We've got a large data set, so I don't need to do cross-fold validation. So I'm going to hold back 10% of the data as my validation set and then train on the remaining 90%. Uh, actually configured the DL model, so it's in PyTorch. Um, and then batch up the data. So the bigger your batches are, the more efficient use you'll make of the GPU. So um, the, uh, I, I use batch size of 256, um, and then so I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in 256 bytes across, across the data, and one full loop over the data is an epoch. So we basically keep training until the model performance doesn't get any better, and then we say, okay, it's cooked. Let's see, let's see what we've got. And we'll do that by evaluating the model performance um, at the end of each epoch. Okay, so really quick. Uh, so get, getting pandas to read CSV is just embarrassingly simple. It's it's actually one line of code, uh, and I'm gonna so there's a I'm gonna show you how badly I did it myself. Um, uh, but, but to get it, and what's what's even worse is like it'll even. I didn't even have to give it the data format. I didn't even have to give it the date timestamp format. It just it, it looked at it looked at the first row, figured it out for itself, and it did it. Although the, um, parsing dates does make it a lot slower, um, like six to seven times as slow. But that's our data now, right? So one line of code, and so these are all my session IDs. These are the date timestamps. This is the item they're looking at, and here's the category, and it's it's in memory now, ready to rock and roll. And if I call dot values on this, I get it back as a NumPy array. So pretty much any NumPy function I want to call is callable on this, on this data frame. So I've got access to the full power of, of the NumPy library in here. Okay, so we'll stop that one. Code. This was horrible. So um, like I would say, uh, here you can see where I'm group, I'm calling group by, by this session ID. Um, like this to me felt like SQL code, and I think that's where, uh, I say horrible, it took me a long time to get it right, so that's why I feel it was horrible. Um, but essentially, uh, the, this, this method, so, so here what I was trying to do, uh, just to explain it is, because my, data because my data set is so severely imbalanced, I tried to artificially create um, more examples of the positive class. To give, to, because um, a little trick with neural networks is, the more examples you can give it of both, both classes, the better, the better it should be able to do. This ended up not having much of, much of an impact, uh, but this is essentially where I'm able to. I run through, I group the, um, I roll up all of the, I roll up the entire data frame by session ID, and apply a transformation uh, using a mask, uh, and then I'm, I'm basically deleting a single click from all the buyers. So um, in one fell swoop, in just this line, in just this you know 10, 15 lines of code, I was able to double the number of buyers. Um, it didn't. It didn't really help. So, but I just put it in there to show that. That's probably some of the more complex stuff I did with pandas. Uh, this was the one that genuinely filled me with delight. Right. So, a single line. A single line of code here. Um, so we're going to create a new series, which is a new column on the data set, um, by simply shifting. So taking taking a column, shifting it back by one, um, to find the difference between the two. Find the difference between two dates. And um, fill not available with one and then divide that by um, a time delta, which is a dwell time. So uh, I, I wrote something similar in Java, and it was like a, you know, a class of X hundred lines. And you know, this is you know, the, the tersity and the brevity of, of, uh, of, of NumPy and Pandas is really, is really, is really nice. Um, so there's, and then, uh, then, but then I, then I find I'm doing strange stuff, like uh, I have to like round multiple times, or um, sorry, round it, and then do as type in. So 
that's probably more work on me. But, oh, I should. So I don't claim this code is perfect. You know, this is this is this is code which this is code which gets me to a, a research paper. But uh, I do have plans to part it and make it more production ready. So it'll have a lot more, a lot more uh, comments in it and, uh, and unit tests and things like that. But it's uh, it's fully functional. All works. So we'll we'll run it in a second. Uh, okay. So so I'm now done with pandas and numpy. So I so I've got all my data. In a very large, in a very large ND array, ready to feed it into my network. Okay, so uh, PyTorch is the one that I used. Uh, I did, I did look at TensorFlow and um, Keras, and uh, actually I used to use, I used to use Torch, which is the precursor to PyTorch. Um, I think, I think PyTorch is the most natural deep learning framework that's that's out there. So Tensor, TensorFlow has some strange constructs that I just didn't, uh, I just didn't really felt I needed to use. Um, I use Anaconda, so uh, um, it, it, I think it works. I think it works really well. So, um, and that's also their recommended installation method. Um, and it's super simple to get to get PyTorch installed and up to speed on your uh, up running on your up on your laptop. Okay, so uh, I will claim that to build your own PyTorch model, there's only four things you need to understand. So, um, their their ND array, n dimensional array, they call it tensor. Um, so, which is equivalent to an ND array or a or a data frame. Uh, mod the model itself is extends the module function, uh, sorry, module class. Uh, so we have an error metric that we need to score. So, 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 so the error is the residual error. So it's not going to be the AUC. It's going to be one minus the AUC. So because so if we get a, we have an AUC of zero point eight six, then by definition our error is zero point one four. So we're not, so it, it's the part that's remaining. Uh, that's a criterion, um, and then so when we train deep learning, we have to back propagate the error all the way through the network so that the so that the weights are updated, and we get that for free almost with an optimizer. Um, I'll try that code in a second. Okay, so um, one thing I'd strongly recommend with PyTorch is to use their data set and data loader classes. Uh, I, I I didn't to start out with, and I'll I'll show you the before and after. Um, it's a uh, it's a large, large amount of documentation, but essentially what we'll end up with is a, uh, a very large tensor. But uh, we'll, we'll show that code in a second. So a data set, uh, three, yeah. A data set just extends their data set class, and you have to. So in your in your constructor, you you initialize all of the hidden state that you want to be able to load your data into. That's that's opaque to the framework. That's that's all down for you. You only have to implement two methods. So you have to tell PyTorch how long your data set is. So implement the length, uh, length function. Um, and then you need to, can people say that okay? Is that okay? The la then the last thing you need to do is, uh, given an index, uh, return the item at that index. So <coughs> PyTorch takes care of everything else. PyTorch takes care of the sampling, it takes care of the batching, it takes care of and a collate function. So once you implement these two methods, your code becomes an awful lot simpler. Um, one lesson learned from me was I li liberal sprinkling of assertions. So if I can be sure that the data is correct coming out of get item for my training, then um, I can be sure, it's, uh, unless there's a bug in PyTorch, and I've yet to find one, then as long as this method is good, the data is going to be good all the way into the model, um, which is where I spent it before I moved to the PyTorch data set and data loader framework, that's where I spent a lot of time hunting down bugs. So from a practical lesson learned was, um, this was this was a real win for me. Okay, okay. so I want to talk about embeddings real quick and then we'll have a look at one uh, live. Okay, so now we said we want the model to learn the best representation. Um, neural networks tend to prefer distributed representation, so you don't feed in, if I had a pair of headphones, I wouldn't start feeding in um, the price of that headphones and like some kind of uh, categorical variable that said whether it was um, you know noise cancelling or not, and I wouldn't have a, va a value for you know for whether it's it's black or or silver or whatever it is. What I actually do is um, I'll take the item ID, so that's a that's an example ID from from the data set. I'll convert it to unique ID, and then I'll convert that unique ID to an embedding, where I basically get the model, hey, you go away and figure it out. So I've got no idea which variables are important here. I'm going to move all of those variables into a latent space that I want you to, in, as you're training, I want you to go and discover and explore what's important. And I want you to figure out some kind of similarity metric. So 
you, at the end of it, I should be able to see that a pair of black headphones is almost identical to a pair of silver headphones. Um, but I have no intention of telling you this. I want you to find out for yourself. So you end up with something like, uh, here I can see this in my mind. Yeah, you know, something like this, which is you know, in the comment, very friendly to a deep learning model and exceptionally unfriendly to a human. Um, you know, and this, this tends to explain why DL models become so uh, black box and, and understand because if you because if you look at them on the way through, they're just processing these these lists of data. They're not. It's not something you can look at as a human and figure out what it's worth actually doing. So uh, this couldn't be more at odds with classical feature engineering, uh, um, but it's key to getting good results with, with deep learning models. Um, just uh, so there's a, a, a good article from Adrian Collier, um, and so. You guys may have seen this before. So the idea, if you say um, Warsaw minus Poland plus Germany, you'll get Berlin as your answer. Uh, so you can now do mathematical reasoning on these on these vectors. And Jeff Hinton calls them thought vectors, where they scale up to the to the to the um, to the size of a, of a thought. You can have a sentence vector. Uh, we have item we have item embedding vectors. So that's why when you look at every year when they give you the um, the Google zeitgeist, you know, so Germany and Brackwurst and you know, thing, and, thing, and things like that. It's a, it's all, it's all a lot to do with, lots to do with this and the word pair relationships. Uh, so this is key. So this is this is a key uh, transformation to undertake uh, before training deep learning. So let's just have a quick look at that real quick. So I need to go to my model to show you that. Okay, so I've loaded. Um, so I've loaded and transformed all of my data. So the item data here. If we just take a look at. That data. I'll take a look at the first one. I'll call NumPy and I can get it to a two list. So that's my embedding. So that's so that so that single item is not, now looks like this as far as the model is concerned. Um, so it's a, that is embeddings in a nutshell. Only got ten minutes left to get to stop at seven. Okay, I'll go quick. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that really quick. Okay, when we train the model, we want to use gradient descent. Uh, this is a this is a diagram off the web. Uh, we initially we initialize the model with random values for its weights. So um, there's a there's a there's a non-zero but tiny chance it might already be perfect. But that's equivalent to saying that if I throw all the parts for a car down the stairs, a Porsche 911 will be at the bottom of it, right? So it's a it's a it's possible but highly highly improbable. <laughs> Uh, let's assume we start here, then we want gradient descent to be able to go into this and, you know, here, here this, this beautiful function which has a lovely wide and it's almost impossible to get stuck in a local minimum. But uh, that's where we want to end up, right? So we want our error to be as low as possible given the parameters of our system. So that's what, tra that's what training deep learning is going to do for us. Okay, so how do we train? Um, so what we do is we initialize our optimizer. Here I'm using Adam. There's many you can use and PyTorch supports virtually all of them. Um, Adam, for me, gives me the best reproducible performance. So sometimes I'll get a better re result using classic SGDs, stochastic gradient descent, sometimes Adagrad, but Adam is like kind of my go-to optimizer. Um, but I need to, there's one hyperparameter which is really important, which is the learning rate. So uh, again, Adam is less sensitive to the learning rate than lots of other optimizers, but you're still going to want to reduce it. Um, so uh, PyTorch gives you a nice learning rate scheduler where you can say, um, so passing the optimizer is an argument. Um, we, want, we want to minimize the error uh, so because you can maximize it. Patience is how many consecutive epochs are you willing to wait before you want the learning rate to be reduced or cooled down? Uh, Ravol says, hey, tell me you're doing it. And the factor. So uh, basically, every time, every time we have another epoch and validation loss doesn't improve, I divide the learning rate by two. And that's it then. So uh, hopefully, this is the only for loop you would see in all my code. Right? So if I vectorized things correctly, then um, I don't need to do. I don't need to iterate over the data set. So the only for loop you'll see is for the number of epochs that I'm willing to train, which is which is 20 for me. Um, so give me a start time. Uh, call train on the model, passing in um, my, my arguments, 
uh, what epoch we're on currently now and the optimizer. Uh, and PyTorch takes care of the rest. Uh, it, uh, it, really, it really does. It's, um, it's, um, it, they've, they've tried to make it as simple as possible for the core uh, heavy lifting of training training models. Okay, so, so in less than 1,000 lines of code then, what we have is a system which will load the raw data off disk and give us back an, a NumPy ND array, uh, which we can then convert to a tensor, finally convert a tensor to an embedding, and then split it into two. So uh, a 90-10 split training set validation set, and then feed it into our PyTorch model, and then our error, error criterion. Okay, so let's run that. Let's just run that and see. Now, uh, this is my local system. I'm not on a GPU. Uh, so, just, so uh, what that means is I've got a tiny amount of data, so my validation AUC is going to be um, all over the shop because it, it doesn't have enough data to act as a regularizer to the model. But it will be some nice uh, output or specific things I want to show you guys. So we'll let it run for a while and we'll see what kind of AUC we get. So 0.29, that's terrible. This is a little bit better. Okay, so we got 0.86, which is about as good as it, as it gets. So I'm going to let it go one more so you can see what's happening. Okay. Uh, so these are all, all my transformation stuff. That's not really true out of you guys. So, so what happens is um, I'm reporting an individual batch AUC. So how, how good is it doing every time I see the batch? And clearly it's doing better. So it starts at 0.56 gets up as high as 0.7, um, and here you get a validation AC of 0.74. Um, but what happens is on, on, on this setup, what you'll see now is the batch AUC is getting better and better, it gets to 0.9. Eventually the, eventually the batch AUC will get to re reach one, because the, the number of model parameters um, are, are absolutely huge. So here I've got uh, 1.5 million trainable modifiable parameters in this model. So I'm running, I'm, I'm, I'm running the full model on, on this laptop, but I'm only using a tiny fraction of the data set. So the model has way more capacity than it needs. So it's going to overfit. And you can see that's going to happen once we let it run on past Epoch 4. Um, now my batch AUC on the training set is going through the roof. It's, it'll eventually hit 0 0.99 and 1, but my, my validation AUC will now start getting quite bad. Um, so that's just uh, that's not a bug. That's just like because I, I'm using a tiny amount of data, so I can I can train it for you quickly. Uh, what's interesting here is so here's here's now PyTorch kicking in and saying, okay, Humphrey, we've now run for two consecutive epochs. Uh, we haven't seen a, 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 a consecutive decrease in validation loss, so we're now going to divide your starting learning rate by two. And um, so it's cooling down the system because it's assuming that they were we should be converging um, onto hopefully a global minimum. Um, but if not, then a good local minimum. Okay, okay so how does it do? Uh, in short, it's able to recover 97% of, of the state-of-the-art score without any feature engineering, uh, which is pretty good. It, it trains in a different way, um, as you can see, because we measure, we measure batches instead of rounds. So uh, the, what I'm comparing to is gradient-boosted machines, uh, which are effectively decision trees with uh, also a gradient descent learning function. Uh, but with no feature engineering, it's able to recover um, over 95%, 97.4 actually, um, of the AUC of the, of our, of, of the current incumbent. So, uh, and, and work, work continues on this system, right? So I'm not, I'm not done yet. There's more to do. Um, some last, some last points that I want to just talk about is, uh, I guess, uh, what, what, I, what I think Python gives me that maybe I don't get so much with Java and other programming languages um, is the value of being able to iterate quickly. So fail fast and, and, and move on. Um, that's also true of PyTorch. So PyTorch makes it easy to try new things quickly and move, and, and move on. You don't have to invest a lot of time to be able to try out a new model architecture, a new data representation, whatever it is. Um, I found it very beneficial to have a small local data set that I've just shown you guys training because um, half of the work is making sure that you're indexing that data correctly on the way through. Uh, you know, if, there's, if there is one downside deep learning is, you can, do, you can understand the problem as much as you like, but eventually what you're gonna end up with is an n-dimensional tensor in memory, and you're trying to slice it different ways to get that data feed into your model. And if, you, if, there's a, if there's a bug in your code, good luck finding it, because it's just gonna look like very large tensors of very small numbers. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no type safety in deep, in deep learning yet. 
Um, the, the code I showed you runs on the CPU. It's in, in PyTorch, it's completely trivial to push your code onto, your tensors onto the, uh, onto the GPU. It's just dot .cuda, and it couldn't be easier. It's, um, it's, it's easy as I've seen. Um, hyperparameters make quite a difference. So a hyperparameter is a, a parameter which affects the, the training of the algorithm, and the algorithm is not able to change it itself. So um, learning rate is by far the biggest one, but you know, there's, there's 10 or 15 in my system that, that affect how good, how good the system is. Um, and I've been able to externalize all of those using argparse, so that was a, a nice handy um, library to find. Um, okay, so yeah, and then I was, so this may sound a bit, bit controversial, but uh, I, I, in Python at least, and I don't, I don't hold to this in Java, but in Python, um, I would build it badly and then build it better. So here's an example where I did that. So here's a pull request that I put back into GitHub, and you can see that I've deleted 803 lines of code and added 491. Um, and this is when I moved over to, to use the data set and data loader that I, that, I, that I talked to you about. And it's, you know, forget about the lines of code, but just the, um, the amount of bugs that's resolved. Um, so all of that code went away. Um, but I, I guess I got it working first to a certain value of working, um, and then figured out, you know, hang on, there's a, there's a better way here. And PyTorch tries very hard to be Pythonic, right? As as does Pandas. So I got equal wins off moving to Pandas off my own. Uh, I, I was using my own homegrown Python code and got a PyTorch up there. I don't know if that's a word. Um, but I guess you know, get something up and running quickly, and then then go back and say, hang on, there, somebody must have done this better. You know, somebody you know somebody's probably invested a lot of time handling tabular CSV data or uh, or handling the nuts and bolts of of um, presenting data to a deep learning model. Okay. Uh, specifically on PyTorch and, and benefits I would see of using PyTorch, uh, PyTorch gives you automatic differentiation. Um, all you have to do is implement the forward pass on your models and you get the backward pass for free. So the, the actual, uh, which basically cuts your training code in half. Um, that's a nice win. Uh, it's, it has very nice adoption. So. There's a lot, it comes with a lot, it, it comes with batteries included, right? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of modules already um, inside PyTorch, and there's a lot of people who are contributing um, op um, open, source, uh, open source implementations of new papers all the time. So I was able to use um, LSTM right out of the box. Uh, a lot of papers will, will do all kinds of crazy things like they'll truncate sequences, um, which is not, an in, in industry that's bad, Initially, that's not so good, right? So um, I might say, for example, I have, uh, and this, so in, in, my, in, in the data that we saw there, um, you, the smallest number of clicks would be one, and the largest number would be 250. Okay, so somebody sat there and in one session clicked on 250 things. Um, and you might look at a lot of papers and they'll say, oh, we'll just, we'll trim them all to two, and something like that, but you lose, you lose a lot of context there, clearly. Um, PyTorch, using uh, CUD and CUDA, um, you pad and pack the sequences up onto the GPU, and takes care of that um, in, a, in, a, in a very in a very nice way. Uh, I can't recommend torch.utils.data enough. I think it really it, be, it goes a long way. So once you implement data set and data loader, then you can use their sampling and their samplers. So uh, so you can then um, I, 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 I did try all these. So you can say okay, give me just go through the index one at a time. That's sequential and um, random. So then you're saying okay, let's make sure there's no order in my data, which might might affect the training of the model. You can oversample a particular class. You can undersample another class. You can weight the classes. There's, a, there's just a lot you can do, um, and you can also split uh, samplers. Is how you can split your data set into training and validation sets. Um, the optimizer uh, package or module gives you a lot as well. Like I said, I use Atom a lot, but they 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 ship with a lot of ones out of, out of the box. Uh, and the automatic learning rate scheduler, so decreasing the entropy in the system um, uh, if 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 you're not seeing an improvement in validation loss. That's also that's also a good thing. Uh, okay, so uh, that's it. That's my uh, that's my talk. Any questions? There are there are a couple of tools out there that allow you to do various bits of. Um, data stuff on disk. So Dask, for example, has a data frame object that, that lives on disk, so you don't need to load stuff into memory. And I'm guessing the size of some of the things that gets done, it's just not 
possible to put things in memory? Or does PyTorch interface well with these sorts of tools? Or? Um, I have seen questions about Dask and the Py so PyTorch is a, a really active um, mm. forum, so discussed at PyTorch.org. Uh, I'm not using it myself directly, so I can't comment. Okay. Uh, from my data set, I actually I actually put all the data into Spark first, so I put it, I put it into Spark SQL, mm -hmm. um, and then I built a framework which used um, SQL queries to put it all out. And for a data set of this size, which is reasonable in size, you know, like 33 million events is not... It's still not, loadable into memory, though. It's not a trivia. It'll, it'll fit into memory. Yeah. yeah so I, I, I don't need to distribute across the cluster. Yeah. Um, I, I have no direct experience with Dask, so I can't, I can't comment. Uh, what, I will, what I will say is, um, the, in comparison to Java, um, and I'm, I'm not sure what Pandas is doing under the hood, it loads, the, it loads the data very quickly, and it loads it into a very compressed memory representation. So, you know, I wonder how far, you know, like, if I had a machine with 32 gigs or 64 gigs of RAM, I'd, I'd expect to be able to load significantly larger data sets into that. But I haven't used that. How big an issue is the fact that it's non-human, uninterpretable aspect, the fact that you're doing a bunch of stuff in cough, okay. is that a problem that might hold this area back in terms of the far future? Uh, it won't hold e-commerce back. Um, certainly, it's it's going to be it's going to be an issue in healthcare eventually, right? So you know if you're you know if you're talking about life and death decisions, and someone said someone says to you, hey, uh, I offer you two models. So the first one is slightly um, gives slightly worse results overall, but it'll there there's a there's a logic to it, and I can show you why it's through that decision. The second model will give you better results, but it's almost impossible to understand what it's doing. You know that's uh, you know that's not a good situation to be in, right? So there's there is a, there is a lot of work going into trying to make um, deep learning models more interpretable. I, I, th I think there's a, there's a number of postgrads um, starting here in the school this year who are actually working on that very on that very task. It's Stephen Shocker, he's doing he's doing some work on that with his postgrads. Um, but it's it's hard because uh, uh, they're a dynamical system with a large number. Of, so so my model is tiny in comparison to other models. So there, there was a tweak there. Uh, they're trying to propose a nomenclature for the size of models, so you'd have a ridiculously large module, uh, ridiculously large model, and um, grotesquely large. <laughs> like they're just still going on. Um, uh, one of Hinton's paper last year had uh, billions of parameters, literally billions of parameters. But and, and then when you distribute that in a cluster, you know, like um, you know, so TPUs inside Google, or whatever, that thing would achieve a state-of-the-art result, mm -hmm. but it's not interpretable. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it 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 is an issue. For now, and actually, there was a huge debate about it at NIPS as well last year. So, um, some of the some some of the more statistic-oriented, mathematics-oriented guys, they basically said, "Look, this is this is not good enough. You know, there's a there's a problem here." And then there was a big lash back the next day where people said, "Well, empirically, it is winning." You know, and it's uh, that's also true. When I when I said that the deep learning broke out in 2010, that was solely on the basis of its empirical results. So, prior to that, people like Yoshua Bengio and other people had produced papers which said. Um, by all means, you might want to use support vector machines and deci decision trees, um, but we can prove that they don't have the mathematical horsepower to be able to solve these really complex nonlinear, nonlinear functions. We said, "Yeah, great, okay, but I'll take my understandable stuff over your stuff any day." And then in 2010, you had that inflection point mm -hmm. where empirically it won, mm -hmm. and I think you know that's all. You know, there's a real industry momentum behind this as well, where you know Google and Facebook and Netflix, they know this stuff works and they just do use it. Um, but there are, you know, ultimately you're right, there, there will be some domains where the, the black box nature is going to become an issue. Apparently the EU is bringing in stuff now where um, if you were declined, for, so forget about healthcare, let's say if you were declined for some service um, or if somebody was declined for a loan, you're entitled to ask why. And if it's on the back of a, of a deep learning... The computer said no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the computer said no. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to ask about. Um, when we have a system with rules, we can find out what those rules are, and very often we find that they, those rules have been systematically biased against certain groups. Based on the training set? Well, uh, or, or even when there's a system that's, that doesn't have a training set, just a system, a manual system, a manual system. When you're not allowed in this room. Say. For example, yeah, yeah in, the worst, in the most obvious case, but it, mostly they're, they're more subtle than yes. that. <laughs> Having some rules at some level allows us to inspect what's going on. Now, your, uh, not what they said, but a, a, a system like this that's learning which 
therapists to recommend for somebody who's looking for a therapist or looking for working for an insurance company or something like that hmm. could be picking up all kinds of Implicit biases bias. from the data from the way the world already works and we wouldn't even know that and worse we'd then be reinforcing it with those systems so there are, seem to be some ethical issues that don't apply when we're clicking on eBay or Amazon for some electronic data. Well, the, I suppose the, 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 issue, the issue there is um, typically you want to be anonymous, right? So people value their anonymity on the web and want to retain that. Um, um, there's a big movement in the ML in the ML community now of fairness in ML, so FI, FIML. So there was a there was, a, there was an entire workshop to vote out of NIPS um, last month in in, uh, in, um, in Long Beach, and I think there is there there is a growing appreciation understanding of exactly that. So if you train on if you download Wikipedia and train on Wikipedia, um, then um, your model will eventually believe that um, and being a nurse is a female occupation, and being a fire being a firefighter is a male occupation. It's it, it will simply do that because of the distribution of words in that data set. And there's a, there's a lot of papers coming out which show which show that. So now there's people um, you know saying okay we need to make sure that we can train these we can train these models and um, where there's you know where you, 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 you can correct for those biases in the data um, and, and well, A, know they're there, and then B, correct for them. Uh, it's a, it's a, but that, that's not a deep learning specific issue, though. I, I, it's that, that affects all of ML. Um, but it's, I suppose deep learning is like a lightning rod for ML right now because it's the most visible, right? But uh, it's, it, it, is, it is an issue. Like, certainly, you know, as a researcher, I'd, I'd hear, at the start, I'd, I'd hear about something like that, and I'd, I think really think myself, well, how, you know, how does that affect me? But, you know, it will it will affect all of us at some point. You know, so like over the over the next 10, 15 years, we can expect to see hard coded business rules. And um, Jeff Dean made a very good point. He said, if you look at any system now, and it has some kind of constant defined in it, so number of threads equals four, right? Let's say, in the future, that will be defined by machine learning. So machine learning will run optimize it as a hyper uh, optimize it you know through, through learning the hyperparameter and say, no no, for this case number of threads should be equal to two because it, it's able to figure out that you know thread locking is an issue. That sounds like a really dumb example. I, I, I've moved away from the fairness question, but he, he made a really telling point where he said, if you look at the Linux source code right now or any other system, where where the where the where the developers have kicked an issue into touch by saying, oh make that a configuration parameter or make it a constant, we can expect to see some kind of machine learning core actually taking that back in house and deciding it in a dynamic way in the future. And from a fairness and ML point of view, it's going to be much harder because the, these models, they, they ingest the data that we give them and they do exactly what we tell them to do, for better or for worse. So if we give them biased data, they will present biased outcomes. And, and I think the only way to, to tackle that is to, is to actively say, okay, we will, we will train on non-biased data sets and work hard on interpretability. So one of the things I think you would have uh, gotten across is how easy it is to, to do these things, thanks to Python. Um, is that a good thing? Is that a good thing that now anyone with a moderately sized computer and an internet connection can build a machine learning, a deep learning model? Is that a good thing? Uh. As a, you didn't say cryptocurrency, so I'm going to say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's uh, that, that, that's the only that's the only downside. Uh, I, I would argue I would argue yeah. You know, so like um, you know, who's to say that the next machine learning DL breakthrough won't come from, let's say, a prestigious, uh, you know, ivory tower machine learning research group in one of the big the big top ten names, mm -hmm. and you know maybe it'll come from you know uh, you know a he or she working in their you know, and they and they and they, they bought a machine learning rig for you know six seven hundred pounds. You know, so uh, I don't see I don't see that. Uh, you can you can use it for bad things, right? I so think that's what I'm alluding to is that yeah, so someone uh, in their ivory tower might at least be aware of the negative impacts. For sure, for sure. And but you know, uh, last year um, some terrible papers went up in archive, right? So um, some researchers they iterated over <laughs> all of the CCTV footage in a shopping center. And then predicted who might be a shoplifter, uh, without even blurring the faces. 
you know, uh, like, which is just, just ridiculous, you know, so researchers can make mistakes too, right, but um, I guess uh, I, would, I would see it as a rising tide lifting all boats, right, so, um, you know, that I think the, the, and I think in a couple of years' time, we'll look back at PyTorch, and PyTorch is hard, you know, so, um, because to Torch, PyTorch is already far more elegant and better than Torch was, you know, in, in my opinion, and I, I, used, I used both pretty heavily, you know, and I'm like, PyTorch right now is at 0.3.0, and they're not even claiming a version 1.0 release, so I think these things are just going to get better and better. Uh, we were having a conversation in the corner there about um, by the end of this year, um, there's probably going to be a collapse in prices for GPUs because um, uh, AMD Vega is going to give a lot of competition and uh, they've, they're they promoting their HIPS porting library which gets your, your CUDA kernels straight over onto their, onto, their, onto their hardware with virtually no rewriting of C or C++, plus, C or C++ plus code, so it's a, it's a fast avenue. And then on top of that, you've got um, further out. You've got um, dedicated hardware like FPGAs or systolic arrays, um, which are which are you know actually a 1980s idea come good again. Mm -hmm. So uh, they start processing as soon as the data hits their buffer, um, and you don't even have things like an external clock or a scheduler. It's, so they're more biologically plausible. And then you the the Intel the Intel Nirvana chip. So. They're obviously going to get rid of the Xeon Phi because that was a that was a terrible piece of junk, um, but they acquired a company called Nirvana. They were showing benchmarks at, at, um, last last month, and they were blowing away GPUs. Um, so you could see so so then that will become the high end, and you'll be able to buy like a GTX 1080 for you know maybe a couple of hundred quid. You know, I, I I would think and 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 and, and then I think um, you know the more people doing this stuff the better. There has to be rigor in research. There, there, you know, I think it's more about the experiments and validating what you're coming up with. What companies most likely should be looking at this? What I, what I think is really interesting. I, I think almost every company should be looking at it because I think if you're if you're able to if you're able to frame your problem um, in a, in such a way that you you know like a classification or a ranking problem or, or an output problem, I I, I do think now that the, the you know, the decision whether or not to use deep learning, the only question would be is, have you got the data or not? So let's assume so that the, the compute power is now going to become ubiquitous and fairly cheap, right? So any, any company can say, look, you know, there's a thousand pounds and I'm going to build a nice, you know, a nice server with a nice GPU in it. And uh, um, then the only question then is, have you got a nice data set that you can, that you can run? Um, so th a nice data set with a problem you've been looking to solve, uh, that's that. That's the only. That's the only stopper now. A lot, a lot of companies think they have nice data sets and they actually don't, right? So you know, you'll. Um, they've been saving. Uh, I, I remember one, one, one particular instance where they've been saving all of their weblog data for years. They had terabytes of weblog data, but they haven't been saving the cookies. So they were they were unable to create those. Set, they couldn't group by any kind of session ID. So they had all the clicks and they had all the buys. But you were never you weren't able to put the two mm -hmm. two, two together. Which then you go, okay, this isn't going to work so well for you. Uh, so it you know it's not quant it's, it's it's quality of data as well as as well as quantity of data. But so that there's there's an excellent paper by um, Jeff Dean just got released, and this kind of blew me away because they built a machine so their model constructed a more efficient B tree representation of an index for their web logs. It was it was twice as fast and one sixth of the size. Um, there was some downside to that paper. It was a read-only index, um, so you couldn't update it, but uh, that works for a lot of people. And for me, that was the first time where I saw it. Um, so that moved into a database, right? That's machine, that, that's, that's DL deployed inside a database. And it's now claiming to have a better indexing strategy than you know, what's inside Oracle or Postgres or SQL Server. And that's me thinks, oh, okay, wow. So it's gonna go inside network drivers, it's gonna go deep inside the OS, it's gonna go inside the kernel, and eventually it'll end up inside business logic as well. <coughs> um, obviously. Then, then interpretability and fairness will be will be big questions. But I think, uh, and and that's why I put that thirty year question mark in on the presentation. You, you know, if that's what people are doing now, I, I I do think all of these problems will be surpassed. And um, you'll solve the problem of needing large amounts of data. You'll be able to train on small amounts of data. And um, companies will get better at acquiring labeled data sets, or they'll move to an unsupervised setting. Compute power is getting cheaper all the time. It's going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And um, and uh, you know the. I think you know even even now if you look at undergrad courses here in the university other universities, people are already using this stuff. You know, so whereas you know a few years ago this was postgrad stuff, and uh, you know, so it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna grow and grow. I think. I'm uh, 
I'm a huge hand waving fanboy for <laughs> for, for, for So maybe maybe you find somebody who's cynical about it, like my supervisor, and then. I, and, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer. When you showed your code demo, um, you came up with a 97% uh, result. Uh, yeah, I, I recovered 97% of the of the, so of the state that, of the art. So does that mean that it predicted accurately 97% of the time whether it was a buyer or a clicker? No, no. So AUC. So so my the AUC we got, um, I got an AUC of 0.836. So and I always get this wrong, but let's so so AUC says if I randomly pick a positive. If I randomly pick a positive sample from my from my data set, then I've got a 83.6% chance of claiming it's positive. And if I randomly pick a negative, I've got the same the same the same chance. So it's a so so no, I, I'm not claiming at 97%. Okay. I, I'm, I'm comparing uh, that number, which was current state of the art, um, with my deep learning number over here. But that's without any specialist training on the with zero feature engineering. Yeah, so this what was the comp it was part of a competition? Do you know what the results of the competition were, did they? That that is that, that, that is the best result from the competition. Ah, okay, right. So that's well, what I that's what I was comparing myself to. Uh, they used Grady Boost Machines. And they used a proprietary version of it, uh, Yandex did, which handled categorical variables um, in some more efficient way. And they just recently open sourced it, actually. So uh, they, they the the big the big GBM implementation is obviously XGBoost. Um, XG Boost from Chanky Chen, um, they they use and those guys finished second and third, but the guys who finished first had a proprietary extension on top of it, uh, which used which handled categoricals in a, in a better way. Um, so, so there's a lot of no, I think so. Um, sorry, this is a slightly naive um, question. The example you gave of shopping for headphones is quite an easy problem to solve, because it's already quite quantitative in, in nature. What kind of strategies or approaches are used when you have a, a more qualitative problem that you want to be able to express in such a way that it can be a problem that can then be tackled by this kind of system? I, I'm not sure I understand. Can you, could you help, help me understand the well, question better? How does one get from some kind of real world question, some kind of question about the world itself, oh, okay. into something that can be expressed in a form that you can then throw a system like this uh, at it? It's a lot harder. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would argue that the field, the subfield of DL that's doing that right now would be the reasoning, attention, and memory um, field. So. Um, Researchers like Jason Weston of Facebook um, and uh, a few other a few other guys are basically saying, oh, "How do I how do I um, iterate over a corpus of data?" Um, and they actually use Lord of the books, the, the Lord, Lord of the Rings, um, and they've got a paper where they can say, uh, "Frodo Frodo has Frodo has the ring. Frodo left the Shire. Frodo went, you know, to that that crazy mountain with the volcano. Where is where is the ring?" And and it's able, actually it actually uses it uses LSTM. It uses LSTM and it's able to read and write facts to memory, and it's able to reason over that memory bank. Um, it's a it's a it's a semantic associative memory, mm -hmm. and it pops out the right answer. It says uh, it says the, the ring is at the ring is on the mountain. Um, that's ba based on what I think you're asking. So that, so that kind of like facts about the world, reasoning over those facts, almost like prologue prologue facts, and like that's that's that, that's where the or that's where the RAM stuff is coming. So the reasoning, attention, and memory. Um, you know, so one of one of the goals that YouTube have is that I think this was two years ago. So they they wanted to take five years to be able to generate a script for every YouTube video. So they would annotate they would annotate all the frames, you know, one by one, and actually have a, a, you know as a, 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 a image image to text representation of what's going on inside inside that video. Not not captions as a, a script. Script, yeah. So some so semantic analysis. Instead, yeah. remember the Nvidia. Nvidia had, had that semantic segmentation of the, you know, like this is a tree, that's a car, that's yeah. the, that, that's the room. doing doing this doing the same thing. But that was it was very interesting, but it was actually slightly different from I I didn't express my question hmm. uh, very well. Right at the beginning, you showed us some examples with uh, of self the self driving cars and how they have to uh, will be required to turn. 
video representations of the th real three-dimensional world into problems that can then be solved uh, in order to make decisions in self-driving cars. Another example uh, might be, for example, to analyze, say, photographs or paintings or even pieces of music for their characteristics, whatever they are, and maybe identify those characteristics of those pieces which would then be considered aesthetically pleasing or popular by actual people. So th those kinds of problems where the, the uh, you know, you don't have buyers and clickers, but you've got much more complex and less easily differentiated mm. uh, data. That is, um, you'll use the same, you'll use the same um, construct store, right? So, uh, what I want to do. The only reason that, let's go back a bit. So the only reason that my model is simple is because I've made the output layer simple. So I've, I've said, okay, in this setting, we're going to do a binary classification. Uh, what's quite normal, uh, what you see a lot of those, those models do is they would have an embedding as their output as well as their input. So um, given, 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 a, given, a, given a, a sequence of embeddings as input, you know, iterate over using a CNN or LSTM or whatever you want to use, but give me an embedding as an output where that, where that embedding is a rich action. So that embedding might be um, a sequence of notes to play and some kind of rhythm to apply to give me um, aesthetically pleasing music. And, I, and actually, actually one of the examples does, it, does exactly that on the, on, the, on the Google page. So that, that Google page is a, a brief recap of all of their work. And they're working on in, cre in creative modalities like music creation. And they're working on the uh, the robot, you know, the transfer learning effectively, where you go from a, a visual representation to actuation of motors. Uh, they're working on many different things, including including self driving, and and you know, I guess the it's I won't say it's easy, but in, in terms of a model architecture, you're really just talking about a more powerful output layer output layer here, um, uh, which I don't need right now because I'm going for the classification task. When I when I extend this for the recommendation task. I will also make this be an embedding because I'm going to ask it to say, given this sequence of items that I passed through this layer here, can you tell me which one, what's the next item which is most likely to be clicked on by that user? So I, I, I will also be looking for a richer output representation, but not in this phase of the research. Uh, I would say I, I would say PyTorch, and uh, um, I got I, I, well. Like, we, we do some data points for this. So on the DL meetup internally, um, at, in January of last year, so 12 months ago, I was one of two people using. No, so none of us were using PyTorch, and um, because we moved on to PyTorch came out in February, so PyTorch is literally uh, 11 months old, and um, everybody was using Keras on top of TensorFlow, um, and I was using Torch because Torch had the best. In, uh, for historical reasons, the best LSTM implementation. Um, everybody inside that DL meetup now has moved on to PyTorch. So they've all, all those people who are on Keras and TensorFlow have moved across. And if I was going to, if I was going to do a text summary on what they what they said in the groups, they said Keras is great to get you up and running quickly. It's a nice abstraction on top of TensorFlow, but very quickly you find that you you start doing things in Keras like callbacks. So um, let's say, and I don't know how, how to do this, but let's say TensorFlow is the cockpit of a 747 and Keras is the cockpit of a Cessna, right? So it's, um, it's doing the same thing, it's flying the plane, but one's an awful lot simpler than the other. But once you start digging into your code, you'll find, hey, but you know what? I really need access to that button or to that lever. And if you don't have it in Keras, sometimes you can fight hard to get it. Whereas if you use the native framework, TensorFlow or PyTorch in my case, then you've got it. Right? So I, I had that same problem. I wanted to implement skip connections over the Christmas. And you know, I, I thought I was going to get a, a better result. Um, and I was able to do it in PyTorch in about 20 minutes. Um, it just, I, I was able to just go and plug in. Um, so a skip connection would say, uh, present the raw input here and here and here over and over again. So, you're, so different layers in the LSTM get both 
the abstracted features from their previous layer and they get the benefit of the raw data again to see if they can now maybe figure out something, something better by having access to both of those. The main benefit of skip connections is it, um, it gives you a much smoother gradient descent problem and pe pe people have shown that they've actually mapped out the, they've asked, mapped out the error, error surface. It didn't make much difference for me uh, when I was done but I do know that because I had access to all of the plumbing code in PyTorch I was able to put it in uh, quite, quite, quite easily. Whereas with, with Keras you need to say okay are skip connections supported? Great if they are, if they're not now I'm going to have to put them in callbacks and all the rest of it. Probably the best, if I was being totally neutral about it, I'd probably need to try both. Um, I just, uh, I know, I, my transition was from Torch to PyTorch, and those guys, their transition was from TF plus Keras onto PyTorch, um, but they all, they all made that transition. Uh, you, should come, you should come to the DL meetup, uh, there's a few people there who will be able to give you more hands-on details. There's one, that, it's one on Thursday. Cool. AWS I've heard good things about Apache MXNet as well, actually. And uh, so, um, and one of the nice things about Apache MXNet is you can actually code it in Java. So then you get strong typing. Should I say that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, because actually, because actually I'm, I'm, I'm much more of a Java coder than I am a Python coder, but I am, I am uh, rapidly being converted to, to at least having holding them in, in, in the same esteem, right? Uh, but so I, 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 know one, I know one company in particular, um, they had a problem uh, it, it, the, the guy said, "I'd make a tiny change in Python code, um, because Py it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be caught because you know there's no compilation step or anything like that. I'd ship it, and then you know the next day there'd be a there'd be a problem. You know, so either the next guy in the pipeline is saying there's a problem with it and it doesn't work, or you know, God forbid if it gets pushed out to production or something like that. And, you know, some, something's gone down. You don't get that with Java because Java has all this infrastructure around it, like Jenkins and CI servers, which Python has too. But life is easier in Java because of the strong typing." So MXNet, although it's Scala, you get all you, you, you get all of that you get all those same benefits. So I I've heard good things about MXNet. I haven't used it. Okay, let's thank Humphrey once again.